we're gathered here to commemorate the Islamic terrorist attacks which killed thousands of Americans on September 11. Islamic terrorism is not something that you will hear about in any of the speeches of the day. President Trump has failed to mention it. Vice President Mike Pence has failed to mention it. All of the official commemoration ceremonies have left out the actual perpetrators of the attack. Imagine if we had been discussing Pearl Harbor without ever mentioning the Empire of Japan or the Holocaust without ever discussing Nazi Germany. That is the situation we're in. And if we want to understand why we are failing to win this war, we have to begin with the fact that we are failing to name the enemy. That is a point that President Trump made throughout the campaign. And yet now we are once again back into the strange twilight zone in which we are attacked by terrorists, by extremists by a minor, tiny minority of violent extremists, but never by a specific group. There is never a specific group that is responsible for the attacks. It is not Islam, certainly, because of course we all know that Islam is a religion of peace. And how, how could it be otherwise? Certainly the fact that the very last sound that came over the flight recorder from Flight 93 was Allahu Akbar has no bearing on it. The fact that the very same sound Allahu Akbar has been heard in terrorist attacks in London, in Paris, in Barcelona, of course, also has nothing to do with it. We all know, of course, that Allah and that Islam have nothing to do with the attacks, and that is why we are stuck in the middle of the longest war ever, in which most of the time we are trying to protect Muslims from other Muslims, only to be occasionally shot by the Muslims that we are protecting. And of course, we have never been able to puzzle out how we can possibly win a war in which we can't possibly name the enemy. Turning back to that Tuesday, to September 11th, it was a, da a day, a time that divided my generation. It divided us between those who were cognizant of the threat of Islamic terrorism and those who chose to live in denial. Those who joined the military, who joined the police, who got involved in politics in order to resist the threat, and those who became political activists on the left, those who converted to Islam, those who did everything possible to aid and abet the threat, those who came out and volunteered as pro bono lawyers for the Islamic terrorists at Gitmo, those who voted for Barack Hussein Obama, who made it his mission to release every single Islamic terrorist from Gitmo and nearly succeeded before his term was up. That is the fundamental generational divide. It is the divide between those who can name the enemy and those who cannot, those who can step up to the fight and those who will not. When September 11th happened, I was just one of the countless people moving upstream through Manhattan from ground zero. Even then, we were all trying to figure out what happened, who was behind it, what was the reason for the attack, and of course, it was the great question, why did they hate us? Before long, there were, of course, quite a few people who were willing to supply us with the answer. Some explained that it was the Quran, there was the Islamic doctrine that preaches hate and death toward non-believers, that commands Muslims to enforce their writ to enforce the good and forbid the bad on all the domains of mankind. And there were others, of course, who gave us a very different answer, who said that it was American foreign policy, who said that it was our wars, who said that it was our determination to free the Saudis and the Kuwaitis from Saddam Hussein, who said that it was our support for Israel that was to blame. If only it wasn't for our foreign policy, this would not have happened. And in some ways, the debate has changed very little since then. Barack Obama came into office in part on a platform of blaming American foreign policy. The current president, President Trump, has come into office on a platform of asserting our right to defend ourselves. And yet, in some ways, our basic foreign policy has changed very little. We are still fighting the same sorts of wars. We are still trying to defend Afghans from the Taliban, even though it's been very clear by now that the Afghans like the Taliban more than they like us. We're still trying to decide between the Sunnis and the Shiites who are killing each other in the Middle East. And we are still convinced that we can pressure Israel enough that it can really defuse all the conflicts in the Middle East. And so, in some ways, no time has passed at all. September 11th, the original September 11th, might as well be today. It might as well be every day. Because we have not learned anything from it. We have not moved on from it. And the reality is on that day, very little had changed, very little had moved on. We knew that it was not over when we found, when the rescue workers found that there was nobody in the ruins on the rubble at ground zero. We knew that it was not over when the President of the United States told us to go back to shopping. We knew it was not over when the television began going back to all its regularly scheduled programming and stopped showing the constant footage from the rescue workers at ground zero. We knew it wasn't over in Afghanistan, we knew it wasn't over in Iraq. We knew it wasn't over when Osama bin Laden was thrown to the sharks. It still is not over. The war continues, the war goes on, and as each September 11th passes, 
we become less cognizant of the original attacks and of the causes of those attacks. People are forgetting the history. They are forgetting just why this happened and what this all meant. We are forgetting the stories of the heroes, but we are also forgetting that we were attacked because we are a free people, because we choose to believe that we can actually elect our own leaders, that we can actually allow everyone to practice their own religion, and that we can actually allow people freedom of speech, and yes, that does include drawing Muhammad cartoons. We've forgotten all that, and in the process, we are forgetting the reason why we are a threat to the terrorists. We are not a threat to the terrorists because we have large bombers or because we have missiles and tanks. There are other countries, including countries in the Middle East, that have those. What threatens the Islamic terrorist, and it is indeed an Islamic terrorist, is our culture, our way of life, and the fact that we do not obey them, that we do not worship as they do, and that we believe that we have the right and the responsibility and the power to be what we are. This is a cultural war. It is a civilizational clash. The terrorist attacks, even the devastating terrorist attacks of September 11th, were just a worst-case scenario. Even as, even as Islamic migration continues to flood into this country, the Islamic population in this country has dramatically increased. Instead of reducing the population of Islamic settlers since September 11th, we have dramatically increased both them and their policy and their influence. Keith Ellison was formerly with the Nation of Islam and is now affiliated with Islamist organizations such as CARE, is now the second in command of the DNC. Barack Hussein Obama, a man who described the Islamic call to prayer, which includes the very prettiest sound on earth that was heard by the passengers on flight 93, uh, became the president of the United States. And so we are still commemorating a war that does not end. We are commemorating a tragedy that has never been resolved. The war continues, the struggle goes on, and we must go on with it.